Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar today. This webinar is a presentation of the Energy Storage Technology Advancement Partnership, also known as SDAP. And our host for this webinar is SDAP Project Director Todd Olinsky paul Our topic for this webinar is Measuring Energy Storage System Performance, a Government Industry Developed Protocol. And we have some excellent guest speakers with us today. Before I pass this over to them, I'd like to go over just a few quick housekeeping notes. All of our participants for this webinar are in listen-only mode. That means that hopefully you can hear us, but we can't hear you. You have a couple of options to connect to the audio portion of this webinar. You can either connect using your telephone, calling in, uh, or you can use your computer, mic, and speakers. Uh, a very important note, we ask that you please submit your questions when you think of them throughout the webinar by typing them into the question box on your webinar console and hitting send. We will be reading through your questions as they come in um, and we will, we're trying to save about 15 minutes at the end of the presentations for a Q&A with the audience. So we'll be reading through your questions as they come in. Um, we'll get to as many as we can at the end. So type your questions in when you think of them. It's the best chance uh, you have of getting them answered sending them in early. And finally, this webinar is being recorded. You'll find a recording of this webinar as well as all of our previous webinars uh, through the SDAP project on our website at cisa.org backslash webinars. And we will be sending you a follow-up email with links to all of the webinar materials from today. And with that, I'd like to pass it over to our host for this webinar, Todd Olinsky-Paul. Todd? Thanks very much, Samantha. Welcome, everybody, to the webinar. Uh, this is another in our ongoing series of STAP webinars. Uh, you could go ahead and advance the slide, please. Uh, I'm the STAP project director from Clean Energy States Alliance, and uh, our entire STAP program is funded and supported by uh, Dr. Emily Zhuk of the U.S. Department of Energy Office of Electricity Delivery and Energy Reliability, and by Dan Borneo at Sandia National Laboratory. So we want to make sure to thank them for their support. Uh, next, next slide, please. I'm going to do a really brief uh, introduction of STAP, and then I will introduce our panelists, and we will go right into the presentations. I just do want to mention one thing that's a little different than what we usually do. Uh, if we we anticipate a lot of, of questions, and we often don't get, have time to address them all during the hour. So since we have a lot of registrants for this webinar, and we anticipate more than the usual number of questions, we thought that we would compile the questions that we don't get to during the hour, and then our uh, uh, esteemed panelists will be able to answer them over the next week or so, and we can then send the re resulting Q&A document out to folks who were on the webinar, but, uh, you know, well, to everybody that was on the webinar, uh, but particularly, of course, those who asked questions that we didn't get to <clears throat> during the hour. So, uh, so please do enter your questions and just uh, know that we'll get to as many as we can now, and then uh, if there are remaining questions, we will try to answer those over the next week. Okay, uh, so just to let you know, um, you know, STAP, as I said, is a project of CISA. Uh, key activities are disseminating information, such as uh, we're doing right now in this webinar, about energy storage, and uh, facilitating public-private partnerships to support joint federal-state energy storage demonstration project deployment, which means that essentially we, we try to bring states and municipalities to the table to partner with DOE and the national labs to support energy storage demonstration projects. Uh, thirdly, we support state energy storage efforts, uh, which means that <clears throat> states that are, are uh, putting resources into energy storage uh, sometimes you know, can use a little help and uh, technical support, and so we, we provide that when we can. Next slide, please. So uh, if you aren't on our email list, and perhaps, you know, you found out about this webinar from a colleague or something of that nature, 
and you'd like to be on the list and get uh, notices about future webinars and other events and materials that we distribute, go to our website. This is a screenshot uh, of the website. Uh, there's a, a red uh, circle around the sign up button, which will put you on our email list. And then there's also a red arrow on the left side pointing to our webinar archive. This webinar is being recorded as are all our webinars and will be archived uh, with all the other ones we've done over the past years and could be reviewed uh, at any time. Next slide, please. So with that, I will now introduce today's guest speakers. And um, OK, I've just been informed that Emory has arrived, which is great. So um, I will go ahead and introduce all the speakers. We'll start with an introduction from Dr. Emory Zhuk. He's the director of the Electrical Energy Storage Research Program at the US DOE Office of Electricity which develops a wide portfolio of storage technologies for a broad spectrum of applications. And as part of the program, he also supervises the $185 million ARA stimulus funding for grid-scale energy storage demonstrations. Dr. Zhuk is internationally recognized as an expert on storage technology and holds a BS from Fordham University as well as a PhD in theoretical particle physics from Purdue University. Uh, following Dr. Zhuk's introduction, we will hear from Dave Conover, a senior technical advisor at PNNL, which is Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Uh, Dave has been involved in codes and standards development and deployment for 40 years, focusing on how new technology can be more readily accepted and approved in relation to health and safety requirements in codes and standards. He has graduate and undergraduate degrees in mechanical engineering from the Catholic University of America. We'll also hear from Vish Vishwanathan, I hope I pronounced that correctly, uh, who has over 20 years of experience with battery development and battery systems, with emphasis in the last five years on developing test protocols and testing and analyzing grid-scale energy storage. Vish is PNNL's technical lead in the DOE OE-sponsored energy storage performance protocol development effort and the head, uh, U.S. head of delegation and technical advisor for the IEC TC120, working on standard development for grid-connected energy storage systems. Finally, we will hear from uh, David Schoenwald, who is a principal member of the technical staff in the Electric Power Systems Research Department at Sandia National Laboratories. Uh, he conducts research focused on controls applications of energy storage, including active feedback control for damping of inter area oscillations and development of test protocols for grid-scale energy storage. He received a PhD in electrical engineering from Ohio State University. Uh, that's the slide, please. And I think that brings us to uh, the beginning of our uh, presentation with an introduction by Dr. Zhuk. So I'll pass this over to Dr. Zhuk. Um, hello and welcome. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Uh, so, welcome to this webinar, which is about work that uh, we have been supporting for a while now. And uh, you are hearing the fruits of uh, our work. And what it really is about is to put energy storage performance on a more objective basis. Uh, companies and others report how particular storage devices uh, operate, but there is really no consensus as yet uh, either what should be measured and how it should be measured. And this webinar is about that. Next slide. OK, so it's about performance-based standards of measurements for energy storage systems. The salient point here is that they're performance-based. They deal with devices operated the way they will be operated in the real world. And of course, these are standards of measurements. They are not standards on the measurements. That comes later. So all of these 
deal with specific use cases, and we have so far considered eight. Others will be upcoming. The protocol that was developed uh, represents an industry consensus. This is important. Uh, this is not something imposed by the Department of Energy uh, or by any particular organization. Uh, it is the result of uh, long discussions uh, among a group of experts uh, to develop a consensus on the protocol. The protocol will provide a basis for fair comparisons between different technologies. This is not a question of mine is better than yours. Uh, this is a question of, you know, when you mean uh, ramping speed is such and such, what do you really mean? And let's compare it uh, among different technologies. Now, what do we hope from this? Well, it does all kinds of things. It's really the basis for proceeding in an orderly fashion. It promotes consumer confidence. Uh, it may lead to product improvement, because once you know uh, and have carefully measured and compared with other technologies, uh, you may want to work on your technology. It allows tracking performance, because uh, devices do change over time. And by having a standard protocol of measurement, we can track the performance. And then, of course, we, uh, along with that, we can improve performance guarantees because we will know what is happening uh, more precisely, and uh, we can set uh, limits to it and uh, develop uh, insurance and monetary guarantees. So insurance is the next one. You can get better insurance deals because you will know exactly what's happening with your system. Uh, it also clarifies the value proposition. Uh, you know, you go from the performance to what it's actually worth. But in order to do, know that, uh, if you're going to use it, for example, for ramping, then you have to know exactly what does your device do. So uh, I hope I've convinced you that uh, we have done a lot of work here and that there are a lot of good applications of this work, and now I will let you hear from the experts. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Dr. Zhuk. And uh, we'll pass this now to the first uh, presenter, who is Dave Conger. Hey. Um, good afternoon or good morning, depending upon what time zone you're in. And I'm going to quickly thank you, uh, uh, Emra, for your um, introductory uh, uh, remarks, and I'm trying to get the, uh, do I have control? Yes, you do. Just uh, just move your mouse and click on that first slide. Got it. Sorry. That's OK. Um, so the purpose of the webinar today, and I'm going to kick it off and then turn it over to Vish and, and David, is an update on what's been going on with the protocol recently. And hopefully from this, you have a better understanding of new metrics, new applications that have been included in the protocol, which was first released in November of 2012, um, and also understand a new format um, that actually makes it uh, a lot easier to apply and use the document uh, compared to the original version uh, back in uh, late 2012. And, and to re reiterate a comment that uh, Emra made, uh, which is this has not been just a, a DOE PNNL Sandia effort. We've um, engaged over 100 stakeholders, uh, entities, organizations uh, in doing this. Um, so it's really our hosting and facilitating the development of industry and others to uh, develop this protocol or what you would call pre-standard. Uh, this project was initiated in March of 2012, the first version um, that covered two applications, peak shaving and uh, frequency regulation uh, for energy storage system and provided for seven metrics was released. In June of 2014, there was a um, what's called revision one um, uh, that was, was issued, um, or a second revision, uh, and that added one more application 
uh, microgrids, and now recently in April we have a third version. Um, we've added five more applications, more metrics, and this revised format. So I'm going to go over that, and then Vish and David will get involved in some of the technical details. Um, we made it a lot simpler to use. You describe the boundary and content of the system. You identify what the storage system will be applied to, and I'll cover what eight applications there are. So you can test and evaluate the system for just one application or all eight. Um, for each of those, then, you would be providing specifications and performance metrics. You go ahead and take the measurements, and from those measurements, you determine the result of the metric, and then you report it. Uh, fairly simple, and as I said, it's a lot easier to understand. So the new applications are noted there, um, volt bar support, power quality, frequency control, PV smoothing, uh, and PV firming. And for each new application, um, the protocol describes and defines what it is. There has to be a duty cycle for each of those applications because they will perform differently based on, the system will perform differently based on what application it's, it's supporting. Um, we confirmed which existing metrics were applicable to these five applications and, if necessary, adjusted them uh, for the application. And then there were a number of new metrics that were identified and have been added. So when I go beyond applications, if I look at kind of the information that's, that's requested, um, and there's a table in uh, the protocol, we have general information and technical specifications. So there's actually, when we now report on the system, it's not just the two applications we used to have and uh, the results for, of the seven metrics. There's actually now general information and, and technical specifications we've included. Uh, this was at the request of uh, the Electric Power Research Institute uh, Energy Storage Integration Council. So there's a lot of information that were uh, the protocol uh, request that deals with general information and just specifications of the system. Then going beyond that, um, and I'm not going to get into each one of the subjects. Uh, you have copies of the protocol. You have copies of this presentation. Uh, in terms of reference performance, this is not duty cycle driven. This is performance of the system um, regardless of what duty cycle. And we've added a couple of new um, uh, metrics. Uh, you run these tests once and you get uh, the answers, so to speak, as described uh, there in the table. Um, and reference performance, we've added reactive power ramp rate, internal resistance, standby energy loss rate, self-discharge rate. Again, these apply to all energy storage systems, and you just run it once, regardless of what application the storage system would be applied to. Um, in, in terms of um, the reference performance, as I've said, you regard it once, um, and there are separate cases uh, and equations for when the auxiliary load is powered by uh, a separate uh, uh, line as opposed to being powered by the storage system itself. Um, there are a number of um, uh, nuances which I won't go into in detail. Uh, in terms of duty cycle performance, so you have a duty cycle for each application. So if your energy storage system is going to be used for one application, you only need to run one set of tests using that duty cycle. If it's all eight, then you run eight sets of tests, each one being run um, applying a different duty cycle uh, applicable to the application to the energy storage system. And Vish and Dave will, will get into the duty cycles for the five new applications. Again, added metrics um, for Volt Bar, which uh, application, which uh, Vish will get into, and power quality and frequency control. Um, again, with some of the applications and duty cycles, there are certain metrics that are relevant just to that application that needs to be addressed. 
enhancements, um, so your rubber duty cycle uh, tests in conjunction with the reference performance test. So you, when you're doing your reference performance test, it's not like you have to disconnect everything, set up the test again, and so on. You just measure it once in reference and then start applying your duty cycle. So you can use the same test setup, the same data, data, scattering, uh, data gathering scheme, et cetera. Um, and then you have result tables uh, that are provided um, to, to help guide you in gathering the data and using the data to calculate uh, the results and then reporting them. So I'm going to turn uh, the, uh, the slide and presentation now over to Vish, who's going to cover uh, an overview of volt VAR, power quality, and frequency control applications, the new things in the, the most updated protocol we're covering. And then he's going to turn it over to David Schoenwald, who will cover two, the two additional applications that Vish doesn't cover. Vish? Thank you, Dave. Um, so far, we have... Um Prior to this Volt War work, uh, we have been looking at just the real power in and out of the energy storage system. Uh, in the Volt War uh, work, what we did is uh, look at uh, the reactive power going in and out of the energy storage system. So we figured rather than start from scratch, uh, piggyback on the work, uh, excellent work done by uh, the Smart Inverter Working Group uh, published in the Sandia document with multiple partners. I have not named all of them. Um, essentially, uh, in, volt, uh, in, uh, in terms of reactive power, what are the various ways the storage can provide reactive power? One is uh, maintain unity power factor in the grid. One is maintain a fixed power factor. One is vary the power factor or do volt war control. So this work looks at uh, volt war control. Uh, during this operation, what the energy storage does is only volt war. That is the assumption of this working group. Of course, in the real world, you will have real power and reactive power going through the uh, storage system but we wanted to keep it simple for now. So the, we assume that the available uh, reactive power is equal to the rated apparent power, and so the storage uh, absorbs reactive power uh, when the grid voltage is too high and sources reactive power when the grid voltage is too low. And this is used mainly in distribution grids of this uh, particular uh, specifications. So then the next slide. Okay, yeah, so uh, to recap, uh, in, in, when the grid voltage, there is a dead band around the nominal voltage, say 120 volts, for example. And if the grid voltage is less than the dead band, the storage sources reactive power. If the grid voltage is greater than the dead band, the storage absorbs reactive power. And so we are going, we are, uh, as in the next few slides, what we will do is uh, look at a case for uh, uh, when there is a photovoltaic system in the grid and uh, cases where there is no photovoltaic system in the grid. When we go to the next slide, so this is a case where uh, there is a photovoltaic system at the end of a 4 kilovolt um, uh, feeder uh, near a high school and uh, as you can see that the grid voltage uh, fluctuates a lot and as the grid voltage fluctuates a lot, we have the storage system uh, uh, respond in terms of uh, sourcing reactive power when the grid voltage is uh, less than 0.97 times nominal and uh, absorbing reactive power when this, the grid voltage is greater than 1.01 .01 times nominal. So clearly the red dead band here is 0 0.99 to 1.01 .01 times nominal. And based on that, uh, this, is, this is the storage output. Just for, as an example, over here uh, when the um, uh, grid voltage is uh, about less than 0 0.97, you can see the storage is providing as much reactive power as possible. And here is a less aggressive signal where the storage uh, starts um, providing uh, provides the maximum power when the grid voltage is 0.94 as opposed to 0.97 here and absorbs the maximum power when the grid voltage is 1.06 as opposed to 1.03 volts here. And here is the storage output or input as the grid voltage changes. So as we go to the next slide. Okay, uh, that was the case. In the previous slide was a case of uh, where the grid voltage uh, in a, where there is a photovoltaic system. Uh, at and then my colleagues here at uh, PNNL they use Grid Lab D to simulate the uh, grid voltage at uh, about nine different feeder locations, out of which we happen to choose three different feeder locations. And in this slide, I have chosen now uh, two two uh, feeder location. One is where the feeder voltage is greater than nominal, nominal being one times uh, one power unit, voltage unit, and one where the uh, grid voltage is above 
and below uh, nominal. And based on that, when the grid voltage is below nominal, clearly the so storage sources reactive power. And uh, when the grid voltage is above nominal, the storage absorbs reactive power. In this case, the grid voltage is always above nominal, so the storage is always absorbing reactive power. Reactive power is being in the this axis here. Okay. As we go to the next slide. So now we go go back to the real power mode, power quality. As you know, when there are a lot surges in the uh, uh, voltage, the for a few seconds, the storage needs to um, source uh, uh, real power in order to make sure that the voltage in the grid is uh, within specs. So uh, in this slide, what we have is uh, two two cases. In fact, I'll go back to the previous slide. We are look, looking at duty cycles for uh, where the storage will provide uh, peak power for 1 minute, 5 minutes, and 10 minutes. Uh, and so these, these are the metrics for uh, this particular duty uh, application. What is the peak power for 1 minute, 5 minutes, and 10 minutes? With that, in the next slide, here is an example of the storage sourcing reactive uh, real power for 1 minute. Here is the example of storage uh, sourcing real power for 5 minutes. And the duty cycle for 1 minute happens to be 24 hours. And for this, for five minutes, happens to be 12 hours. Now, what happens when there is a sudden loss of load? You know, then you need uh, to inject power for about real power for 30 seconds, after which you can have a, a gen set or something kicking in. And also, what if there is no gen set and you want the storage to take care of both uh, the um, uh, loss of load for 30 seconds or uh, secondary frequency control which is loss of load, loss of uh, generation I mean for 20 minutes. So then the storage has to provide uh, power for either 30 seconds or provide for 20 minutes. Now in, in frequency control you can also have sudden loss of load. So in, in, instead of providing a real power the storage will absorb real power for either 30 seconds for primary frequency control or uh, 20 minutes for secondary frequency control. In the next slide I just I have given one example of a sudden loss of generation where the storage is sourcing a real power for uh, 30 seconds. So here the metric would be what is the peak power during discharge for 30 seconds or peak power during discharge for uh, 20 minutes and then similarly peak power for charge for 30 seconds or 20 minutes. Okay. Now this what we have done so far is st uh, storage pro providing the maximum real power it can for 30 seconds or 20 minutes or absorbing for 30 seconds or 20 minutes. Now in the pre ESIC group uh, there was Bruno Prestat had uh, provided, made a presentation based on a uh, demonstration project at uh, France, I don't know how to pronounce, Ventia. It's a 2 megawatt, 1.3 megawatt hour system. Uh, essentially in the top axis you have the frequency changing and in the bottom you got the power changing. So as the frequency goes down the storage sources power and vice versa. So my colleague Alistair Crawford, he developed this linear uh, relationship that uh, relates the uh, storage power to the uh, normalized frequency. And based on that, in the next slide, you'll see that for four seasons, we got this from a local utility here. I can mention their name now because it's uh, public information. Alistair provided us this uh, uh, information of the grid fr frequency across four seasons, and based on that, the relationship uh, we developed, uh, our working group developed, we got the uh, storage power, um, um, real power as a function of the frequency. Here in, the, in this case it is a function of time, but in the previous slide it was frequency as a function of time. Here is the storage power reacting to that uh, frequency change as a function of time. This is what we call dynamic frequency control. And over to Dave Schoenwald from Sandia. Thank you. This is Dave Schoenwald. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. OK, great. So the two applications that I was uh, working with were PV smoothing and PV firming. And we'll start with PV smoothing. There was a working group that we had that looked at what are the issues in PV smoothing and how does one construct a duty cycle, a test cycle, that would be appropriate to uh, test the performance of a battery system or any energy storage system for smoothing photovoltaic power output. In this case, smoothing refers to the fact that we all know 
that PV power can change rapidly in terms of uh, out, uh, power output in very short periods of time as clouds pass over the through the sky. Uh, various things that can occur on the um, PV side can result in power fluctuations of many uh, uh, large swings over very short time durations. We're talking about seconds, uh, sub-minute kind of time durations. And this can really impact power quality. It can certainly lead to voltage instabilities or very poor voltage level control. So PV smoothing is the use of an energy storage device to try to smooth out these high frequency components. And the idea is to come up with a duty cycle that represents a power, an energy storage device being able to smooth these high frequency components and create a much more stable power output, but not over long periods of time, rather over short periods of time that would be able to prevent uh, large power fluctuations from being dumped onto the grid. And oh, I think, OK, there it is. So the PV smoothing duty cycle that our working group came up with looks like what you see on your screen. And this is over a 10-hour period of time. Let me point out and let me thank the uh, Public Service Company of New Mexico for access to three years' worth of data from the PNM Prosperity Project in Albuquerque, New Mexico, which was one of the ARA projects involving energy storage for both PV smoothing and for peak shifting. In this case, this was from the PV smoothing battery that was a 500 kilowatt, 350 kilowatt hour advanced lead acid battery with an integrated supercapacitor. And the signal that we came up with was a composite signal derived from 10 different hours from multiple days of PV power output on this particular uh, site. And it's not a representative of a single day, nor is it a representative of uh, synthetic data. This was taken from actual data. And as you can see, it's been normalized so that it's agnostic to the size of the energy storage device. And so the idea was to come up with a test signal that represents highly variable days, an uh, aggressive test signal, not overly so, one that is not so much a energy intensive application, but more of a power intensive application. So think of short bursts, injection and absorption of power done over very short time scales that will reduce the fluctuations or the ramp rates of the power output that is coming out of the aggregation of your battery and PV system. So the 10 hour duty cycle that you see there was derived from many of these days and the overall energy amount that is needed is pretty neutral. It, it's almost zero, uh, very small. So it's very much representative of the kind of test cycle that an energy storage system would need to be able to perform for PV smoothing. The next application is on PV firming. And PV firming is a more of a blend of energy and power performance. In this case, you're trying to produce steady power output over a longer time window. Instead of uh, seconds to a minute or two, you're looking at maybe 5, 10, 15 minutes, up to an hour, maybe even two hour time slices. And you want to have a composite production of power, energy storage plus your PV, that looks more like an energy block, an energy pulse that could be shifted in time and it, or it could be uh, used as a possible um, bid into a market for power uh, production at some uh, given time uh, later on in the day, perhaps. The firming part of it is not trying to smooth every fluctuation. It's looking at trying to maintain pre-steady power output. So the next slide shows the actual duty cycle. And as you can see, compared to two slides before with the smoothing duty cycle, this is nowhere near as jagged. The, um, the ramp rates are much smaller. Instead, these are more consistent injections or absorptions of power by the energy storage device to deliver a much more 
smooth uh, unit of energy over time. In this case, the time window of concern is on the order of 15 minutes. That can be varied very easily by the control system that you have for your energy storage device. But in this particular case, it is over a 15-minute time window that would be the, um, the desired uh, pulse or energy width of choice in this case. And this is the 10 hours time signal that you come up with or we came up with, again, using data from the uh, PNM Prosperity site in Albuquerque. And this is, a, again, an aggressive but not overly so time series for testing the performance of an energy storage system for PV uh, firming. So the two applications are, in many ways, they're different, and yet they're both uh, each addressing aspects of PV and improving power quality such that you can deliver uh, an output with the energy storage device that is more uh, uh, applicable or appropriate for the grid. And let me point out that there are more details on the construction of the duty cycles that are available in a companion report to the protocol that you can get on the Sandia Energy Storage website. And the, uh, the SAND reports um, are numbers 3474 and 3636. Uh, you can find those on the website. And so with that, I will turn it over to Dave Conover, and we're now ready for uh, wrap-up. So, Dave, it's yes, yours. Thank, thanks, David. I'm going to do a, this one summary slide and then turn the program back over to, uh, uh, to Todd and Samantha. Uh, I would, would add a footnote with the duty cycle um, that you've heard about uh, from David and Vish, um, five new ones, and then, of course, the three prior existing applications. We had received uh, input from a number of users uh, of the protocol that they they felt they had a different, um, uh, a better mousetrap for a particular duty cycle for a particular application, and they wanted us to figure out a way to effectively consider that. So what we did in the revision to the protocol was uh, indicate if you are going to be applying the energy storage system to a particular application, you have to use the duty cycle that's provided for that application in the protocol. But if you want to run additional duty cycles that you develop on your own, you're free to do that, and you would re then report um, those additional uh, results, and you would describe to somebody interested in the performance of your system what duty cycle you used and um, and how you derived it. So it's not either or. You must use the duty cycle provided for in the protocol to get your 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 measurements. But if you want to do a second or third or fourth duty cycle because you think your system might perform a little bit differently, we've provided that opportunity. So revision one. Uh, which was in, in June of 2014 and included microgrids, it's now being used as a basis for U.S. and international standards. Uh, U.S. ASME is developing uh, standards for thermal systems. Uh, the protocol covers thermal systems as well. Um, and uh, the National Electric Manufacturers Association, NEMA, uh, has uh, an initiative underway to develop a formal consensus standard on this topic. Uh, again, revision two was released just this past April. We've covered that we've got new specs, new applications, new metrics, and we believe it's significantly improved in terms of usability. It's actually fewer pages um, in terms of content uh, than the original protocol because we figured out a better way to organize it um, and, and even though we're adding a lot more metrics, applications, et cetera. And uh, as, uh, as Dr. Brooks <coughs> said uh, in his remarks, you know, proponents and users of these systems, we believe, will benefit because you're able to measure and express the performance of these systems with confidence and in a uniform, comparable, and consistent manner. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Samantha and Todd. Okay, thanks very much, and thanks to everybody who spoke. 
Uh, we do have a good number of questions, and I'm happy to see that we have some time left to address them. So we'll just uh, go right on into the questions and discussion. Uh, a couple of things before we get to the more substantive questions that I think uh, are important. Somebody asked where they should send comments on the document or if they have small, noticed any small edits or typos or uh, if they have any, you know, constructive suggestions. And I sort of, <clears throat> uh, without thinking too much about it, suggested they could send them to me and I'd forward them. But actually, upon sober reflection, I think it's probably better that they send them to one of you. Where, is there a, somebody that w would accept uh, constructive comments? And, if, and, uh, I, if, yeah. if, if I can, this is Dave Conover. If folks want to email me at david.conover, at pnnl, Paul Nancy Nancy Larry dot gov, um, I'll uh, agree to you know ex get them, and then I can work with the folks at Sandia and my coworkers at PNNL to uh, de decipher those and and get them to the right folks so that we can um, begin to look at them as we uh, initiate efforts this year to further enhance and and improve the document. I would request. In submitting comments, what would be preferable is redline and strikeout. If there's a language in the protocol that you want to change, please provide specific revisions. Um, if you have general comments, um, you know, it tastes too salty, it's a little too spicy, uh, those types of things, those are very challenging for us to address. So the more specific you can be about your a comment and specific changes you recommend, uh, the better it will help us in moving those forward through the next round of enhancements to this document. Great. So that's david.conover at pnnl.gov, correct? Correct. Okay. And the other uh, co uh, question that somebody asked that's uh, of the same nature is where they can find or download this document uh, that we've been hearing about. And somebody else wanted to know where they can get the reference table. I assume that's in the document. Um, there's actually a, an append, there is a reference document for each duty cycle um, that goes into the detail of that. I believe all of these documents are on the the DOE energy storage site that Sandia manages for DOE, um, they're also available on our website at PNNL. Um, somebody can also just email me, um, uh, and, and I, I will get them copies. But I think it would be best if you went to the Sandia site, and maybe David can provide the address for that uh, in a second. And, yes, um, I, I, yes and I can do that, that, Dave. A lot of other information they're on that site that's supported by DOE that uh, it, it beyond just the protocol. So, David, do you have the address for that website? I do. It is www.sandia.gov slash ESS. And then once you're at that site, you can look up documents and you can uh, get titles, authors, and you can actually download them as PDFs. And this also includes spreadsheets, Excel spreadsheets, which contain the actual time series data for most of the duty cycles. I, I think just about all of them are on there. I know that they are for uh, frequency regulation, smoothing, and firming. And I think most of the other ones are accessible from that website. So that would be a good uh, starting place to get a lot of these documents. OK, great. Maybe, Samantha, we can get that on the on the uh contact slide that we, we will then put that up. Okay, so uh, moving along with uh, uh, other questions. Somebody wants to know if you could list a few energy storage system vendors or manufacturers that participated in developing these standards. Well, uh, this is Dave Conover. I don't have the document open. There is um, a list um, in the document of everybody that participated. Um, and, and again, this is not a standard. Um, the reason we use the term protocol, or others call it a pre-standard, is 
um, we wanted to engage everybody uh, in the process, and we wanted it to be transparent and open. Um, but, and the intent was then to jumpstart formal standards development by U.S. and international standards developers such as NEMA, uh, ASME that I mentioned, um, uh, and give them something to, to go on for their formal consensus committees. Um, so uh, the, the, I don't remember offhand which manufacturers were involved, but, but uh, the folks that were involved uh, I think are on the acknowledgments uh, page in the protocol. Okay, terrific. Uh, and by the way, Samantha, if we could if we could get that URL on the screen, people are asking uh, to have it repeated. It would be nice to have it. If you if you don't have it, uh, let us know, and we'll we'll ask the uh, the uh, presenters to repeat it. And Todd, if I could add, when we initiated this project uh, back in 20, 2012, and and repeatedly we've done this with with the issuance of the original, and then subsequent updates. Um, we did press releases uh, on the activity. Um, we did a number of communications beyond press releases to key organizations, uh, associations, et cetera, announcing that we were doing this and basically inviting anybody that wanted to to participate. So we would have been happy if a thousand people had responded, uh, but at the time, I think we got about 120. We continued to pitch this, so to speak, and invite everybody um, you know that wanted to, and that that is still open. So if somebody wants to participate moving forward, I think they can get information about that uh, on the same via website that uh, David Schoenwald uh, mentioned that you're going to provide. Great. And Dave, uh, David Trunwald, if you could just type that URL into the chat window for Samantha, she'll put it on the slide. Okay, sure. Uh, thank you. So next question is, uh, are the protocols agnostic to battery capacity size, i.e. some protocols apply only to systems above 100 kilowatt hours and others apply to systems below 10 kilowatt hours? This protocol, to my recollection and vision, David uh, can can correct me. Uh, it's blind as to, to size. There's no limitation on on the size. I concur. Uh, of course, the, having said that, uh, this is wish. Uh, having said that, uh, probably uh, there must be maybe some uh, common sense guidelines in terms of what is the minimum size for a grid requirement. I guess. Okay. Uh, somebody wants to know if this is the final revision of the protocols. I'm assuming that's probably not. Um, actually, that's probably like asking if I went back in time and said with the first edition of the National Electric Code in the late 1800s if that would be the, the final edition. Code standards, protocols, et cetera, um, uh, by need uh, because technology evolves and because of the way uh, we learn from applying documents such as this. Um, this will continue to evolve. Uh, we want to add additional applications, additional metrics, et cetera, et cetera, uh, based on the needs that are expressed to us. And uh, if, based on comments received, if somebody thinks that we need to modify it or tweak it or enhance it, we're happy to do that. And you can get an indication of that if you read the foreword of the April 2016 version you will see how much uh, revision and enhancement has been done um, since the initial um, uh, development of this document uh, and its release in, in 2012. We have a seg nice segue here is, you know, um, if anyone has some thoughts in terms of any applications that are glaringly missing, uh, then uh, we would like feedback uh, in terms of what new applications you would like to be included. Great. And I see that we have the, uh, I guess it's a screenshot of the page uh, up on the, on, oh, no, it's gone. <laughs> we had a screenshot of the, of the page up on the slide where people can go to download the, oh, there it is. You have the URL. Good. Uh, Sandia.gov slash ESS, uh, where people can go to download the document if they want to, to uh, read it and provide some feedback. Um, 
Somebody else wants to know, how will this activity be aligned with the duty cycles that are being developed under the ARPA-E Charges Program hosted at UC San Diego and New York Best? I'll let Fish or Dave handle that. This is Dave. I can't say that I'm that familiar with that uh, effort. So uh, I don't know, Vish, do you uh, have uh, any uh, insight into that? And the only thing I can guess is UC San Diego, uh, I, I believe, was working on a uh, microgrid. So I'm assuming that the uh, duty cycle that they are using is um, uh, catered towards um, addressing the storage uh, needs, a duty cycle uh, for storage in a microgrid application. And we have uh, our one of our applications does cover microgrid, so it would be interesting to touch base with them and see where are the points of commonalities and how uh, um, they can benefit from us and vice versa. Okay. Uh, somebody wants to know what you see as the priority for R and D to support this protocol. One thing I can think about is, uh, you know, one of the things we have not addressed is uh, state of health. And that is now in terms of uh, reliability, state of health is a key issue, how long can uh, storage last. So, uh, you know, our safety is being addressed, of course, uh, Dave Conover and San other folks from Sandia are the leading their effort. But in terms of uh, state of health and reliability, uh, we are starting a, a small uh, program here. And so I would say that that would be the uh, next uh, uh, thrust in terms of uh, R&D. How do we go about uh, estimating the state of health and how, will, how good is that estimate? Uh, how do we validate that? And how reliable is that estimate? I would concur with that. I think that the, um, the wear of the device over time as well, so how is the state of the health in short periods of time, uh, day to day, month to month, but also over long periods of time, that certainly would be an area of important study that would really help the industry. Okay, great. Uh, we have another questioner who wants to know whether there are any guidelines on how to measure ramp rates in the protocol. Yes, there is. Um, there is one metric that addresses just that response time and ramp rate. So, okay, terrific. Uh, somebody wants to know, I'm, I'm not sure uh, exactly how this pertains to, to, the, to the document, but it's certainly relevant to storage. Uh, the question is, how can an energy storage system or battery defer a, su a distribution substation upgrade? Uh, says it seems as if like if a circuit is at or near capacity, the battery would not be able to charge itself because the circuit is highly loaded. Anybody want to take that? So I know that shaving. Go ahead. Go ahead, Dave. Sorry. Um, I, I know that one area that we've looked at here at Sandia involves the possibility of using storage to uh, smooth or regulate the uh, voltage profile on a feeder that may reduce the number of tap changes that a low tap changer would need over need to perform over any period of time, which could reduce the wear on that particular component. And it may also uh, reduce wear on other parts of the feeder if you can maintain a more consistent voltage profile, and that can be done through the use of storage. To add to that, uh, the peak shaving uh, duty cycle we have in the protocol essentially addresses uh, one of the ways you can defer a uh, substation upgrade. Uh, and all, uh, in addition to that, uh, PNNL has been working with uh, a few utilities, and we are we have addressed that particular issue in terms of if the grid uh, power uh, is above a certain limit, the storage kicks in. In addition to that, we are also looking at the volt war integrated uh, volt war control and. Uh, uh, how we can do CVR uh, uh, voltage reduction to make sure that the overall uh, power uh, in the in the grid uh, there are no power losses by keeping the voltage low and thus the power in the grid as low as possible. Okay. Uh, somebody is asking. I guess uh, at some point there was a uh, description of use of ten different hours of data in in you know, in your uh, protocols. 
And the person wants to know if you if if you're using ten different hours of data, how do you handle sharp jumps between hours? Uh, that's a very good question. One of the things that we looked at was the fact that in smooth in a PV smoothing application, in fact, you can have big jumps. So that wasn't necessarily something we were trying to eliminate. However, we were we did do a little bit of uh, transitional uh, interpolation. Uh, right at the boundaries from one hour to the next to make sure that we did not have excessive jumps. And that's especially true in the firming application. It, to, but if you took it all from one day, you're not going to get or you're not likely to get a very aggressive signal. So taking hours from multiple days is still uh, a, uh, an important way to, to construct the test signal. But the, the transitions between the hours, yes, there, there was a little bit there to address uh, large jumps. Uh, but uh, that was an excellent, excellent question. OK, great. Um, on the slide that uh, referred to renewable, uh, I guess, solar uh, firming duty cycle, what does the output of the solar generation look like with solar firming? Yeah, that, that's another good question, and uh, just due to time constraints, uh, it, we didn't have a plot of that. But it, you can actually get more information on the website at the link there under publications. Uh, go under Sandia publications, and the SAN number for the report that has more details on the construction of the duty cycle for the firming application is uh, SAN 2016-2016. 3636, and that addresses uh, that particular question. Okay, terrific. And uh, somebody else wants to know if there's any relationship between this protocol and the ESIC created ESS test procedures. Uh, we have been very actively engaged with uh, ASIC, and uh, I'm a member of the their uh, working group. Uh, the number is happens to be the working group two, which is a performance working group. And uh, initially, they uh, co-opted uh, a lot of our work and uh, piggybacked on the DOE uh, Office of Electricity sponsored work. And then they have also added a lot of value. So it has been a very symbiotic relationship in terms of each side uh, providing, uh, I would say. Um, uh, value to the other. Great. Uh, okay, so I think we, we've come to the end of the hour. Uh, we do have a few more questions that we will try to, or our presenters will uh, try to answer, and we will then distribute the questions and answers to, I guess, uh, everyone who was on the webinar. Uh, and so I just, uh, I just want to thank our presenters for uh, job well done. Very interesting and informative webinar. And um, Samantha, do we have any upcoming webinars that you'd want to mention before we close this out? We do. We have uh, five webinars on the books for July. They are pretty interesting, and you can find out more information on our website at cisa.org backslash webinars. Okay. And just to reassure those uh, folks who keep continue asking, yes, uh, the, the webinars are recorded and archived also on the CISA website. And uh, this one will likewise be archived, and you can review it. If something you missed or you want to send a link to a colleague or friend, feel free. Uh, it should be posted on the website uh, within a day. Okay, uh, thanks everybody, thanks to our presenters, and we will see you next time.